Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Sachin Adams Show. So as you know, we've been reaching out to some amazing guests lately. And Phil Chan, who's our guest today, is someone that we've had kind of in the pipeline for a few months now and been so excited to um, talk to him. So I think as a lot of our guests, Adams, um, deep into a LinkedIn stalking session at maybe 2 a.m. and he stumbles across someone amazing and he'll message me and be like, Sachin, this guy's blah, 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 blah. Let's, let's, let's talk to him. And I think Phil was one of these people. Um, so very broadly, Phil is a human rights specialist and he's done so many incredible things in his career at such a young age. And so there's going to be so much good stuff to dive into today. So as Sachin said, I don't even know how I came across <laughs> Phil Chan, but I basically saw him on LinkedIn. And when I saw some of the stuff he's done, I was absolutely blown away. So some things that we can say about um, Phil Chan is that he is a human rights specialist. He's worked with a number of renowned organizations such as the UN, the World Economic Forum. He's currently working for KPMG in human rights um, and social impact. And he's got a background in law. And you're also the, was it the academic dean of Wesley College? That's right, yeah. And <laughs> Phil has done a whole range of really, really awesome stuff. And if we were sort of, sort of to talk about it all, we'll be here all day. But the first thing I want to sort of put to you, Phil, is that I want to understand what are the passions and the things that are driving you in sort of your roles that you do? And how did these passions form? Yeah, I think my strong passion has always been in human rights and social justice. And that formed when I came to Australia, uh, when I immigrated from Hong Kong. So my family moved here when I was two years old. And in a way, I was like a third culture kid. So I was neither fully Chinese or fully Australian. I was growing up in a multicultural society and trying to figure out where my passions and my interests lie. But also growing up in Australia really opened my eyes to how lucky we are here in our country and the ideals around egalitarianism and mateships and giving people a fair go. And I grew up in Brisbane and I went to one of the largest public high schools there and there were just students from all different backgrounds. It was like a kaleidoscope of different cultures. So there were students who were rich, students who were poor, students from indigenous backgrounds to refugee and migrants as well. So at a really young age, I was exposed to a lot of diversity and difference and also realized that when we went back home each day, we had different life experiences, different families um, and backgrounds to go back to. But equally, I saw them as just my mates, my friends. These were my friends from my maths class, from soccer, from orchestra. And so that really instilled in me at a really young age, this idea around social justice and equality. How can we make sure everyone has the same opportunities to have the same education opportunities, um, to have the same rights? So it really sparked in me this idea of making an impact within society. And that's what led me down the, the law path, um, studying law and going to human rights law. Awesome. It's great to see that like these sort of passions were just built in a very natural and organic way in your early life. So why did you choose law as your vehicle for impact? To be honest, I fell into it. I didn't know what law was. Um, I didn't know what social justice could look like and didn't really hadn't heard of human rights until I got to university. Um, so I was really interested in using my skills to make that positive impact. And when you're young, you don't quite know what you can do and what degree to study or what, which area to go into. And so I actually studied three areas at university. I studied um, media and communications and politics and law. And those are three very unusual and quite different fields. I like to joke they're the three uh, most hated professions or at least the least trusted professions, um, journalists, politicians and lawyers. But it was about understanding where the power in society actually um, lie across our communities, whether it's um, within the legal system, but also through policy and politics. And the interesting aspect about all of these areas is that you can create positive change through that by understanding where the power is. You can use the legal system to create the change. But the law in itself is very narrow and quite restrictive, I think, to create the change. And it's very really important, but it's not the only way of creating social change. So you've got politics and policy, and you've also got like advocacy and how to create social movements. How do we get people to care about the big issues in the world? So those are the areas that I'm really passionate about. And the other area is education as well. How can we inspire the next generation to care about the big issues, whether it's indigenous injustice or climate change? And I always, 
guided by this idea of making the biggest difference, making the biggest impact, and to keep asking myself, am I on the right journey? Am I making the right choices to create that impact? And for me, a lot of that impact comes from the multiply effect. Right? I can create the change in my job on a day-to-day -day basis, and that's awesome. That's quite limited, you know, whether I'm helping a client or helping an organization to do better in human rights. My other area of interest is academia and teaching. If I can teach students to care about these issues, they can go on their lives in terms of a legacy beyond me. So how can I go beyond just myself, but actually create more change by inspiring others to create that change? Yeah, that's pretty beautiful. Adam and I always think that um, teachers, te being a teacher is one of the most noble professions. Um, Phil, can I ask, so it seems like at the start, you, you, did, you went into law, um, you had this interest in um, social justice, a lot from your experience in high school. When did you first start to get the feeling that you could use law to do something big? Um, I'm asking this question from the point of view that a lot of our audience are interested in things like impact, but I think a lot of them would feel like they don't have the tools or they're not the right kind of person to make that a reality. Was there a particular moment where you're like, okay, look, I can have a profound impact in my career? Yeah, that's a, I think, ongoing dilemma, especially when you're young, to think about how you can use the skills that you have. And a lot of the big social issues feel really overwhelming. So you can feel like I can't change that. And it's, too big a problem for, for myself to change it. And often that's fair, but it's really important to firstly surround yourself with like-minded and passionate activists or advocates who care about these issues. So to realize that you're never alone and you can create a movement within your group of friends, but also secondly, realizing that you can create that change right now. You know, you're never too young to go out there and shape the system. So when I was at university, for example, I was involved in a lot of social justice groups and one of the groups uh, was focused on getting ethical coffee and tea on campus. So it was this idea that where does our coffee and tea come from? And uni students love drinking coffee and we should be asking those questions from quite early on. So we created the entire movement on campus to lobby and advocate for coffee and tea. And that involved education and organizing events. So we had guest speakers coming in, we dressed up as coffee cups, handing out flyers <laughs> on Eastern Avenue to students. So we handed out free coffee um, just to get people talking about it. But we also looked at some really interesting um, creative strategies as well. So for example, the student union constitution um, had a section that allowed you to create a referendum. So if you have a certain amount of signatures from the student body, you can actually have a referendum on any issue you want. So we collected enough signatures on that topic. And luckily we had a referendum. Unfortunately, it was non-binding as a referendum. So even though we got 90% of the student population in support of ethical coffee and tea, it was non-binding. And because this union is run by student politicians and classic politicians, um, there was a lot of betrayal and fake promises. So the actual implementation didn't happen, but it took several years of lobbying and publicity and campaigning to really push for ethical coffee and tea. And so at Sydney Uni now, there is ethical coffee and tea, and that's a legacy that's still going on, even though I'm not at university anymore. And that's a great story and great example of how you can create that change within your circle of influence, within your environment even though you're just a uni student, you can actually create on your campus change that is lasting, that actually benefits people. So now the coffee and tea at Sydney University, for example, are not tainted by slavery or forced labor. And that's something really amazing. So my best advice is to really back yourself and to push forward. Find a group of friends who care about these issues and go out there and create change. Figure out where the gap is, where something could be improved. And it doesn't have to mean creating change at a country or a global level. You can just create change on your own campuses, in your own communities, at a really local level. And that's a big difference. That's fantastic. I love that you've really put some of your ideals into action and it's super practical stuff yeah. about seeing like, where is the power in this sort of community that I'm in? How can I start to pull the strings and start to sort of influence the world through, through my vision and make positive change? Yeah. And talk. I think um, you'd be happy to also note that I think ABS now uses biodegradable um, throwaway coffee cups, which is also cool. 
Um, yeah. Fantastic. Yeah. yeah. Good, good. So it's just small changes like that that makes a big difference cool. um, in the long term. Yeah. 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 So after university, you started to have a number of experiences. Some of them included um, journalism, um, working in diplomacy, other human rights things. Um, one really interesting thing on your LinkedIn is that you're an international development um, coordinator in West Sumatra, and you did a number of things like joining the Mekong um, legal team. So I was wondering if you could provide a bit of color into some of those like international develop experiences and what you learned from you, them. You seem to be living overseas for a while, Philip. Mm. Is that correct? Yeah, I did. Yeah, yeah. So I was really lucky. Um, after finishing my university, I received a government scholarship the Prime Minister's Australia Asia Award, which is now known as the New Colombo Plan. And that allowed young Australians to go overseas in Asia to do exchanges and also go on internships and work experience. So I spent my time in Malaysia first with the United Nations, working with the Refugee Agency. And that was an incredible and a very eye-opening experience, working on the front line of the refugee crisis. And I was in the legal team giving legal advice to determine the refugee status of the... Asia is unique because it's the world's largest urban refugee population. And so I saw firsthand the process, but also the bureaucracy behind the process and how challenging it is to actually get protection. If you were to go to the UN office and ask for asylum, you would be given like an appointment slip to come back in three years time. And then the entire process could take up to 10 years to determine whether you're a refugee or not. So wow. it can be really challenging in terms of how long that process is. And even if you are determined to be a refugee, it really depends on countries like Australia and their quota to take you in. And often a lot of the countries in the world who can take in refugees aren't doing their fair share. For example, in Australia, our refugee intake is quite low based on our population size. And because of that, a lot of genuine refugees, people who are found to be refugees, are still stuck in limbo in countries like Malaysia. And it's why they end up jumping on a boat. Like you see firsthand why people are so desperate because you've been found to be a refugee escaping persecution and yet no country wants to take you. So that was really eye-opening for me to work on the ground with asylum seekers. A lot of these refugees were coming from Myanmar, who are Rohingya, um, and from other places like Sri Lanka, Afghanistan, and Pakistan as well. The other kind of area I worked in was in Thailand, which was with an NGO called Earth Rights International. They have offices in Washington, in Thailand, and also in South America. And what they do is advocate for indigenous populations against environmental destruction by big companies. So this could be coal mining or electricity plants or dams, for example. And a lot of these infrastructure creates a dilemma, right? A lot of the countries there want to develop and to grow their industry. And to do so, you need to have electricity, you need to have power, you need to grow. But equally, they were creating this growth um, on the backs of the villages and the local population where it was destroying the environment, destroying their lives. I just wanted to butt in there. I, I find that very mm. interesting that you worked on that because it is two uh, almost conflicting things in the sense that you want to retain the dignity and the culture of these indigenous populations. These countries, we really want growth. We want to take people out of poverty. Um, do you have a sort of specific concrete example of the sort of clash between a corporation and one of these indigenous communities that you can talk about? Yeah, there's coal mines in North Thailand, for example, and the coal mine was really important because it created coal, which then created energy for the whole country and the region. But equally, the coal mine was built without the consent or the participation with the local population. So the companies just came in and, and developed, and it meant that a lot of these indigenous villages were forced to relocate um, and lost their livelihoods it's a very agriculture based livelihood and by creating the coal mine it destroyed the land and there was a lot of pollution as well so there was a lot of the coal dust in the atmosphere and a lot of villages died they actually had cancer because of the coal mine so there was a direct link from the company's action and the impact on the local population and it's that tension right that you've rightly pointed out adam there where how can you ensure sustainable growth and yet equally respecting the rights of the people on the ground. 
and the two can coexist, but it's about finding the human rights based approach and working with the villagers so that they have that participation and to have the advocacy from them. So they, there's, their voices are actually heard in the whole process. Mm, that's immensely important stuff. Um, I think it's such an important point because we've just got so much influence of corporations in those countries. And it sounds and almost like a chicken and egg problem, right? You, yeah. <laughs> it's hard to know which side to start off with yeah. um, in the reform. It, it really reminds me of the view of like shareholder versus stakeholder capitalism and that these companies have got to, they've got to act with a conscience because they've got a lot of stakeholders that they have the impact on and that we have to find ways to promote growth, but also respect all the stakeholders in the, in the and, I, and I think a great example of that in practice recently was that I think it was Rio Tinto, their CEO actually stepped down after um, they destroyed some indigenous land. And that was great because obviously in the bottom line, that wouldn't have had a profound impact, but it did have an impact on stakeholders. So um, that like examining that shift is something Adam and I are very passionate about. Uh, so yeah, Phil, after you kind of continued your um, international work and you did some stuff with the United Nations, um, the High Commissioner for Refugees, um, can you speak a little bit about some of the issues you saw when you worked in the United Nations? I had some experience with the UN and it was always my dream to work for the UN and to spend that time within such a big and important organisation. And the United Nations has such an important role to play in our society. It was created after World War II um, to ensure peace and security in the world. And even though it has ma many failings, it's definitely not perfect. It's a really important organization in our world. And there's a great quote from a former UN Secretary General, which says that the UN was created not to take us to heaven, but to save us from hell. And I think that's a great quote because it's around being really pragmatic and practical. We're not going to have a perfect utopia. Unfortunately, we can aim towards it and aspire towards it and we should all push and advocate for that. But equally, you have to be quite realistic about the geopolitical situation of our world and to work with that. So despite all the deficiencies of the UN, I think the UN does a lot of interesting work. And so I spent some time with the UN Refugee Agency in Malaysia, but I also worked on a project um, on children's rights and and the digital age. So the UN looked at some research and some policy changes around children's rights and technology. So when the United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child was created back in 1989, it did not contemplate technology at all. And now children and young people grow up as digital nomads. So the idea behind this project was how has technology impacted for good or for worse on young people's lives? And the research from that is really interesting where technology has been a great enabler for children's rights, whether it's the right of participation and free speech, access to information, to creating a sense of community that's online. So for example, if you're a young person with disability and you're online, you feel like you're, you don't have a disability anymore. You're treated the same as everyone else. So it's been very empowering for young people. But equally, a lot of young people don't have access to digital technology. We imagine that everyone has access to it. But in reality, in Australia, for example, in regional and remote communities, a lot of young people still don't have access. And there's the quality of access as well, whether it's good Wi-Fi or not. And then in developing countries, there's a lot of, there's a big gap. There's a lot of young people who still don't have access. So it's transforming, but we need to make sure more young people have access to technology. And there's a lot of debate around the right to the internet, for example, whether that should be a human right. Yeah. But equally, we need to look at the flip side of the coin, which is the negative impacts of technology. And this idea that technology has amplified a lot of things like cyberbullying, for example, or privacy risks to even the dark side of the internet, where it's um, child exploitation and big issues like that. So, we need to take a holistic look at technology. So yeah, it's really interesting how the UN is starting to see um, digital technologies as a right, especially for people in developing countries, um, just because of their significance and importance. Where are organizations like the UN um, at the moment in terms of viewing these as rights? Are, they, are we sort of in a process where those are literally going into declarations and we're viewing them as rights or is there still a lot of contention on this? There's still a lot of debate and discussion on it. So it's more of an academic discussion right now rather than any changes. It's very hard to change 
any of the international conventions or to create new conventions out of it. So it's still up for debate, but these are very fair discussions because as we move on in our society and there's new developments like technological de developments, we need to recognize how we consider those technology through the human rights approach as well and whether the existing frameworks that we have are sufficient. You know, a great example would be going back to the refugee issue is the United Nations Refugee Convention. That was created also after World War II and look at refugees from um, World War II, so particularly around Europe, um, the Polish um, or the Jewish refugees who were escaping from the genocide happening there. But now the civil conflicts that we have are domestic conflicts and the Refugee Convention didn't actually contemplate that there will be ethnic violence within a country. It only contemplated uh, wars and conflicts between two countries. So it's the challenge around keeping up to date where international law can lag behind uh, as opposed to ongoing developments in our modern society. So it's up to the United Nations to keep working and developing um, these frameworks and rules so that they apply to today's society. Yeah. And obviously like a big critique of the UN. And as you said before, there's no perfect system, but of course it's state sovereignty. And I was wondering throughout your career, um, do you see any kind of way forward for us to, for international bodies to regulate human rights abuses and kind of overstep this barrier? Um, and I'm more talking about how the internet has democratized things. Um, information flows very freely now. Do you, do you see this technology playing a role in kind of diminishing state sovereignty anyway? That's a fascinating question. I think we are seeing that. We are seeing the rise of technology and globalization and we're seeing the lack of relevance with borders. You know, state borders, countries' borders are arbitrary. And with technology and communications, we've been able to override any borders and actually create a global village. So our whole world is not defined by these boundaries anymore. And that's really exciting. And I think that shows the change in power and the power dynamic, the fact that it's no longer so country specific, even though they have state sovereignty, we are seeing different movements at the grassroots coming up, uniting people across the world. Another example would be, say, the US, and under Donald Trump, they pulled out of the Paris Climate Change Treaty. And as the US, that was a big move as the world's superpower. But yet you saw the rise of other types of entities. So you have states that decided to go ahead with the climate change commitment. So the state of California, for example, said, we're not, so as a country, as a whole, we're not doing it, but as a state, we'll follow it. You've seen businesses step up and rise to the challenge saying we will commit to these targets regardless of the fact that our country has pulled out of them. So you are seeing that disintegration of the importance of the nation state. But equally, we're seeing the opposite happening. You know, often a lot of these things are really complex where around the world you're seeing the rise of authoritarian regime where people are clinging back to the nation state because that's familiar and comfortable because globalization is quite scary and it's moving so quickly and people are being left behind. So I think it's important for us to use human rights as a framework to address the problems of globalization, making sure that the least of our society, you know, for example, the Trump supporters who feel like they've been left behind by globalization, that their rights are cared for and protected, that they have a voice as well in this global project. It's not just the, the young mobile affluents who get to play in our globalized world, but everyone deserves a chance and to have that opportunity. Yeah, that's very interesting. And just following on that point of globalization, so you sort of mentioned that we've seen um, increased uh, nationalism across the world, um, some sort of more authoritarian um, tendencies, and there is a bit of a pushback on globalization. So I, I don't want to provide a sort of value judgment on nationalism. I'm not saying it's a good thing or a bad thing, um, but I just wanted sort of your opinion of Diplomatic, I like it. <laughs> I just want to sort of hear your opinion of the, the next 10 years, where do you see this trend of nationalism going and potential sort of deglobalization? Do you think this is something that we overstate about deglobalization or do you think it's a very real thing? Yeah, that's a very good question. I think globalization is inevitable. 
with the rise of technology and the world that we're in. But we need to address and make sure that people who are worried about globalization to listen to their voices as well and to make sure they're part of the journey and they reap the rewards of globalization. I think for the younger generations, we do live in this global world. And I think a lot of us consider ourselves to be global citizens, but we need to make sure that a lot of people feel left out by it. And so their rights are just as important and we need to ensure that their voices are heard and that their needs are met through globalization so that we don't leave anyone behind. And that's this idea around sustainable development as well, is to ensure that everyone reaps the rewards and so it's because it can be really scary and even with this year and with coronavirus it's showing how challenging it is to live in a globalized world but to ensure that that fear doesn't create um, more negative implications in our world that it doesn't lead to people retreating back to their borders closing down borders rising discrimination rising xenophobia it's the beauty of our world is how diverse we are and to celebrate and to recognize that. So I'm a big champion of multiculturalism and a globalized world in that way, but also recognize that people are scared and we need to acknowledge that. Some people benefit from globalization, others don't, they're disadvantaged by it. How can we make sure people are on an even playing field? Yeah, Philip, in all of your answers in our conversation so far, there's one attribute that shines through to me, and that's empathy. Because every answer you have, you're bridging the gap between, okay, we have people that are left behind by globalization, yet we still have um, refugees that need a place to live and stuff like that. Um, what role has empathy played in your life? Um, obviously, you said you developed it from a young age, but it, it just like, when, when, when we speak to you, it's just this quality that almost kind of comes out of the screen at us. Yeah, I think empathy is kind of the, the solution. It's an antidote to all our world's problems. So if you look at rising inequality or climate change or discrimination or any social issue, it comes from the lack of empathy, this idea of crossing boundaries and being in the shoes of someone else to, to understand where they're coming from. And in my mind, empathy is a core skill in life. And I wish it was like compulsorily taught at schools and university so we can actually create a better world from it. Imagine if we understood each other better rather than being in silos or bubbles, but actually understanding and seeing the humanity that unites us. I think it's very easy for politicians or leaders to use the difference to divide all of us, but we have so much more in common that un unites us. And that's what is beautiful about our world. And one of the, the best things I like to do is travel. And the more I've traveled, the more I've seen this, the more I've witnessed just how incredible our world is and to have that empathy. And it really challenges you to go outside your comfort zone in someone else's shoes and to embrace that and to recognize that actually we're all pretty much the same. We all have the same needs and desires. We ha have different understanding and cultures but how can we celebrate and have a harmonious coexistence? And that is through empathy. So I'm a big champion of empathy and I think we need more empathy in our everyday lives and in our society. That's a really beautiful thing. I think empathy is a great thing which people should deploy as much as they can. Um, I just want to say sort of a bit of a devil's advocate position on this. So you're very for the idea of people understanding, um, being empathetic, sort of the sort of open borders argument. Now, a lot of people um, on the sort of right side of politics will have a lot of um, opposition to those ideas about all cultures being the same. They'll be like, um, there's very distinct characteristics in cultures. They don't always mesh, mesh together. Countries should have strong borders. We need to really um, vet the people that are coming in to make sure that there can be a sense of integration and that companies should unite around a, a sort of coherent set of values um, and that we shouldn't just have lots of different bubbles of different values in a country. To people that might say those sort of things, how would you respond to that? And another thing I might add is that a lot of people will say that human beings, maybe instinctually, we aren't um, empathetic people. We're actually people that flock in sort of groups and mobs and that we do look for sameness. Um, and like you mentioned, that we sort of get fearful um, with a lot of these talks. How would you respond to those sort of things? I think it's about having 
a balance, you know, in terms of having integration. So I think Australia has worked so well is because we allow people to become part of Australia and to live the Australian values, but equally to respect their own cultures in their own way and to celebrate that and to recognize it. So it's about finding the balance and it goes both ways where you've got new immigrants coming to Australia. They need to take the effort to become part of the society. You can't just live in a bubble in your own communities and not be part of the broader society. But equally, the locals, the Australians, have to then welcome them. So I think it really goes both ways where we can have the best parts, where we have a cohesive society that is safe and secure and have the same values, but equally recognising that diversity and celebrating that difference as well. So it's not a binary decision, but where we can celebrate both. But I think it's, it comes down to just meeting people. Like it's not, we can talk about abstract policies or, or big issues, but if you've met someone and they're different from you, it just changes your outlook because rather than talking about hypothetic groups coming in that you don't know, actually seeing, seeing them as a person, having a coffee with them, having conversation with them, opens your eyes and it challenges perhaps your stereotypes or your preconceived notions about them. And I think that's what it comes to, to bring it down to that grassroots level where we have people meet, meeting and mixing together and embracing and realizing actually you're not that different and you are just like one of us and to share in that sense of community. Mm, I think that's a great answer. And I really, really appreciate that you sort of have that balanced view of it because I think just as um, sort of toxic and harmful, the ideas of just completely closed borders, we should all just be the same. Don't let in different people. I think that on the flip side, when people are too ideologically bound to the idea of completely open borders, letting everyone in, those can just have just as much harm. So I think there does need to be that balanced and integrated approach, which you have. Yeah, and, and I really, really love um, your take on empathy. And it, it seems like in a lot of what you do, it's like bridging, it's making everyone try and understand that we do have this universal human aspect. And although things like technology and can polarize us, I would hypothesize that most people that would be against refugees, if you put them in a room with a refugee for an hour and that refugee told them their story, they'd probably have a completely different conception. So I really like um, you encouraging those conversations. So, so with your current work, you've probably met a lot of um, future leaders and people in the human rights space. I was just wondering over the course of your career and the people you've met and mentored along the way, especially at places like Wesley College, what do you think are the attributes of a leader that can um, rectify some of the human rights abuses or make a kind of profound impact on the world? I'm of the opinion that you can't have a stereotypical leader model, right? We have different leaders and we need different types of leaders. Often in our society, we have the typical leader, which is like the A-type personality, very outgoing and outspoken, ups, is always up the front, leading from the front with a command and control kind of style. But we actually need different types of leaders and we need leaders who are introverts, for example, or leaders who are compassionate or caring, who are, may not fit the typical mold I think to create change, you have to have the vision to see the possibility and to have that drive behind you. So it's about having the idealism, the healthy dose of idealism to create change in the world, but also then with action and the drive to back it up behind you. Often there's a lot of people who are idealistic, but lack the action, but you need both. And you have to have that inspiration and motivation. So it goes back to what I said earlier around surrounding yourself with like-minded advocates and people who care about the issues to push you forward because creating social change can be very challenging and you won't do it overnight. You need to have that perseverance, but it can also be very isolating. So it's important to surround yourself with a community who cares and who can back you and grow your movement as well. I think the other aspect is just having a generosity of spirit. I think we're often very selfish and it's in our innate nature to be so, but to be outward looking, to really focus on others beyond yourself. So have a project, have a cause that is bigger than yourself. Uh, in our generation, it's very easy to just focus on yourself and day-to-day -day life. 
but it's about going beyond that and to find real fulfillment and meaning. And I think that's where you can find it is having a passion or a cause that is bigger than yourself and working towards that. What's your legacy? What do you need to do um, when you're on your deathbed and making sure you have no regrets that you've actually given a hot red go, go and having the courage to create a better world so that for our next generations, when you leave this world, um, you've left it in a better place than you first arrived. Yeah, that's awesome. Sorry, that became really philosophical. <laughs> yeah, no, we love it. <laughs> um, Phil, you, you worked at KPMG in the Human Rights and Social Impact Department. And me and Sachin think that's really cool because we're passionate about how business um, and the impact can bridge together. So I'd love your sort of comments on how you sort of see the future of business in terms of the social impact space and what you saw uh, companies like KPMG are doing in that sort of space. I went from being a lawyer to a consultant, which is quite interesting. I didn't imagine myself going into the management consultancy space, but I went specifically for human rights consulting, which is a really fascinating and quite a new area. It's this idea around business and human rights, which is considered the new frontier of human rights. Historically, companies were left to do whatever they want. They didn't have human rights obligations. It was a responsibility for countries only. But it's only been in the last 10 years that companies have started to realize that they also have responsibilities as well. In 2011, the United Nations created the guiding principles on business and human rights. And for the first time ever set out the responsibility for companies to respect human rights. And this is significant because companies wield enormous power and they can do the right thing and have a big positive impact on the world. But equally, if they do the wrong thing, they can have a devastating negative impact on the world. So the idea is to get companies to do the right thing through the human rights perspective. And this is significant because it goes beyond corporate social responsibility. So CSR is really important, right? But it goes beyond CSR because it's not just fund runs or fundraising, but actually turning the mirror onto themselves as a business. As a business, is your business model actually causing harm to people? Like on one hand, you can be supporting cancer charities, but then at, on the other hand, your business model could be supporting slavery, right? So it's about being holistic about your business and making sure that your business model, your operations, your supply chains aren't causing harms to humans, whether it is within your workforce or your contractors, but also in your communities as well. So this is a really exciting area that's very new, but companies are starting to realize this is significant. And we're seeing a big change in our world. We're seeing investors, for example, caring about the shareholders, customers, employees, all coming together to demand better from companies. So I'm very hopeful going forward, even though this change is slow, that over time, we will see more ethical businesses who care about their profits, but not just profits alone. They also care about people and the planet and to have a purpose. And in the future, those are the companies that will survive. Those are the companies that will be sustainable by taking a holistic approach to ESG risks, so environmental, social and governance risks and the impact on people and our planet. Yeah, and I think this is something that Adam and I are super passionate about now because we, we, we very much agree that literally if you want to have a good business in the future, as Gen Zs and millennials get older and they become the people in power, we care about this stuff, right? We care about our grandkids having a planet that they can um, live on properly. And if businesses aren't supporting these things, there's a huge um, profit risk as well, which I don't think people consider enough. They consider CSR and... Um, the whole impact investing scene and, you know, um, profit as mutually exclusive things, which I think is an important kind of re-education we need to have in our society. Um, but that's really interesting. Philip, I, I know this can sometimes be awkward to reflect on our own positive qualities, but I was going to ask you, across your whole career, you've done all this amazing stuff at such a young age. What, what qualities do you think you have that has made all this possible? I think the quality that has made it all possible is being a nonconformist. So not following the well-trodden path and being, having the drive to want to do better 
in finding fulfillment and finding impact. So it's really easy to you know, go to university, for example, and get a job and then live your life and that's it. But I think from a young age, um, I just had this wild idea that you can actually do so much more and to see life as an adventure that you're on and to try different things, to pursue what you actually want to do and to take the risks in life to forge a new path, right? So in the human rights path, it's really challenging. It's not a defined path. It's not like you can graduate from university and get a graduate role in human rights. You almost have to create your own path out of thin air and find the niche areas, have unpaid internships, try everything and then you get there. And so it's that kind of blind determinism um, you might have to up just... the coffee along the way. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. Yeah, it's about creating your own adventure. And I'm very passionate about this idea of being a career entrepreneur where you choose and design your own career rather than going up the corporate ladder or following what society tells you to do. It's this idea that actually a lot of impact and a lot of jobs aren't created yet. In the next 10 years, there'll be a lot of jobs that will be new for the first time. And so it's for us to actually explore and go out there and to create that change and to have the courage to do so. And the courage ultimately comes from that drive and the passion and the mission of creating a better world. But it's also a courage where it's a calculated risk. You'll always have a fallback, you have a safety net. Like for example, I can always go back to corporate law um, I left corporate law to pursue human rights and that was a big gamble. A lot of my peers didn't know why I did that. My family didn't know why I did that. They were like, you studied so hard. You, you went to Sydney Law School, you graduated, you landed a job at a corporate law firm, an international law firm. Why are you throwing it all away? And I was throwing it all away because I was driven to follow my passion in human rights at all costs knowing that I have the safety net. If I failed, if I couldn't get a job, I wouldn't be left on the streets. I can just go back to corporate law. I may be a few years behind than my peers, but that's okay. I will still have a job and I can have a, that safety and that security. But what I've done is actually taken that leap and it's been exhilarating. You know, you don't look back. You realize that actually you forge your own path and even though sometimes you fail, you pick yourself up and you keep growing and you keep learning. And that is a much more satisfying journey than having a you know, nine to five stable job in a suit in the city where you're not passionate about what you're doing. So I'm really keen to see young people follow what they really want to do and to give it a go, particularly if you're in the privileged position where, where you can, where you have a university education, you have a career ahead of you, you can always go into accounting or investment banking if you really want to. But if you don't, go out there and try, because if it fails, you can always go back to being an investment banker. But what if you succeed? Imagine what that looks like. Imagine if every young person in our world who have that opportunity actually take it and the world would be just incredible. We are a much better place because we're all fulfilling our passions. We're living out the lives that we were meant to be living. Yeah, that's awesome. I think that's fantastic advice for students. Um, I, I was actually going to ask you after, what is it that students now can be doing to sort of follow in your footsteps? But I think you absolutely just answered that. And I think this is a trend that me and Sachin are seeing a lot more with our guests in the sense that it's not, if, if you want to do amazing things, it's not about following a linear path, but it's about, as you said, forging a career of your own making. And that's by sort of having the audacity to take on big opportunities, reaching out to people and having great qualities like the sort of empathy you have. And I, and I think something that also stands out to me is also being true to yourself. It seems like you've always been this kind of person from a young age. And if you'd become a corporate lawyer, I imagine there'd be afternoons where you're like, you'd feel like maybe you weren't that being that true to yourself. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of people that maybe that corporate law and that investment banking is being true to themselves. And I think we have to acknowledge that. But if you have that tendency, I think what you're trying to say, Philip, here is don't waste it especially when you're young, because there is a lot of fallback options. Good answer from you though, Sachin. I think, yeah, being true to yourself is important here because that sort of recognises that people can have careers in any sort of aspect, but at the end of the day, you've got to pursue what you really want. Yeah. And so, Philip, as a bit of a tradition on our podcast, when we're finishing up, we like to um, ask our guests if they could 
leave our audience with one thing who are 18 to 25 year old university students who we like to think want to make a profound impact on the world in their lives, what do you think that would be? I think you should have the courage, back yourself and go out there and create the change. And you may not know what you want to do, but that's part of the self-discovery and having different experiences out there. So rather than thinking about it or researching about a particular job or experience, why not just go out there and try it? Try it first, then reflect on it. It will narrow your options. You'll f figure out what you're passionate about. But regardless of what you end up doing, have the courage to back yourself to do it. We're living in a very unusual time with a global pandemic happening. But this is a silver lining for our world. It's an opportunity to really create a better normal, right? We talk about going back to normal or the new normal, but why not just for us to pause for the, in this time and think about how can we improve our society? How can we create a more inclusive, sustainable and more generous world with this opportunity because of the global pandemic? How can we change our systems to suit society better so that it actually is sustainable? It actually respects human rights. So I think even though it's a challenging time for a lot of young people, go out there and create the change that we need. We need that change now. And this is the prime opportune moment. It's now. Yeah, awesome. that was awesome. I'm really inspired now. Um, but yeah, thank you so much, Philip. That was incredible. That was, yeah, fantastic to hear about your career and your lessons. Um, I think you're doing God's work. You're doing great stuff. Yeah. Thanks, guys. It's a, such a pleasure to be on the show with you. And I love the fact that you've taken the initiative out of COVID to create a podcast like this and to share the wisdom to young people and to inspire them in their careers or in their journeys. Thank you. Thank you. That was a lovely episode. Uh...